Um, it seems to me that if you want to get shouted at, and if you want to lose a lot of friends on Facebook, <laughs> one good way to go about that is to just go out there and say something about homosexuality. And it's particularly space that Christians are being beaten out of. The, the public square does not belong to us anymore because our point of view is increasingly regarded as hateful. So today what I wanted to do was to give you a key to understanding that this is a, a conversation that has three parts to it. One of the things that's lost in all the mudslinging and the name-calling is the ability to stand back and to look at what we're really believing. So if you just think about the word, the, the phrase born that way, that is often used, that's really an appeal to a belief system about human ontology. Human ontology is a, a branch of philosophy that uh, studies the nature of things. What is the true nature of something? What makes it different to other things? What makes it the same? So when you say born that way, and there are a lot of people shouting born that way, well, what does that actually mean? And when you stand back and look at what uh, ideas and belief systems about human nature is really being appealed to, then you understand that there are essentially three different parts of this conversation. So I'll go through particularly the first two, and then at the end I'll come to the sexual rights activists and what they think of. But really, these are the three. There's the traditional Judeo-Christian view, which emphasises the importance of se sexual morality. Um, then there's the mainstream view that appeals to an idea of sexual orientation. And then there's the third part of the conversation uh, is the, run by the sexual rights activists. Queer theory sits in here, and they appeal to ideas of um, sexual diversity and liberation. And what the diversity and the orientation crowd are often understood as uh, different ways of saying the same thing, but it's very important that we understand that they are um, different points of view, and they appeal to very different ideas about the human person and the role of human sexuality. So we'll start with familiar territory first, just so that we can all be sure of, that we're on the same page. The traditional Judeo-Christian view of human sexuality says that, as Dr. Mark Jury was saying, everyone is equal in inherent human dignity. Everyone is an intentional creation of God. Human nature is sinful, but we don't have to be slaves to sin. We're not slaves to sin. We can choose not to act on our sinful nature. Sexual sin is possible for everyone, so depravity does not belong to a particular class of despised human beings. It's a universal possibility. So that's quite egalitarian, really, because sexual temptation of every type needs to be resisted by everyone everywhere. And because sexual sin hurts ourselves and others, uh, it's important that we uh, resist the, the temptation. So there's a, a different moral architecture that comes from this belief. It's because God loves the sin, he hates the sinner. It's very important that we resist the sin because it hurts people and God loves people. Sorry. <laughs> loves the sinner and hates the sin. Yes, so yeah. I had it written correctly. I just read it incorrectly. So this gives us a very narrow sexual ethic. Sex is only okay inside marriage. But on the other hand, we also think that sexuality is a very small and insignificant part of the total human personality. So... In that view, celibacy is both possible and harmless, regardless of what Freud might have had to say on the matter. Now, what we're dealing with is a, uh, a, a new identity of the, the sodomite, and uh, the, the homosexual, and I'm going to you know, use it in, in, uh, with a capital H. And this is not a Christian idea. So if you look back through medieval history, see, it is relevant to everything. If you look back at the 12th century penitentials, you have sodomy listed as a sin. It's classed as a type of luxuria, a type of self-indulgence. It goes along with gluttony and the love of fine clothing. So sodomy is a, is a sin. But you don't have this caricature of the sodomite, the, the person who personifies that sin, until the Victorian period. And Foucault, who is not normally a friend of Christianity, would agree that this is not a Christian concept. This is a product of the Enlightenment, the transfer of moral authority from the church to science, and they needed a scientific basis for um, establishing the existing moral order. And so all kinds of sexual excess became associated with lunacy. And so we have the lunatic as the sort of um, caricature of lunacy, and the homosexual was closely associated with that. So it's a pathologized personality, but the identity and the behavior become indistinct. So in this view, it's very important that for, for Christians, the, ident the identity and behavior are separate, the sin and the sinner are separate, but in this view, we have the homosexual in which the behavior completely colonizes the identity 
and the way Foucault describes it was that nothing that went into the homosexual's total composition was unaffected by his sexuality. It was everywhere present in him. It was at the root of all of his actions. This is incompatible with Christian anthropology because the human person is more than a sexuality. But, um, but this is, we're often blamed for this, and this leads us in completely the wrong direction. We end up arguing about, is the homosexual good? Is the homosexual bad? Is it depraved or sinful or virtuous? Can homosexuals be good people? And this is a ridiculous argument. It's actually not an argument that we need to get involved in. It should be very um, a relief to all of you to know that we don't have to defend the homosexual. That's just not a hill that Christians need to die on. That's not our conversation. But what we have in the mainstream belief of sexual orientation is a sort of legacy issue where there is this homosexual identity that we're trying to redeem. So the mainstream belief, and someone almost fell off their chair the other day when I said homosexuals weren't born that way because it just seems to me that a lot of people accept this as um, something that we don't even need to debate. But in this view, sexual orientation is a thing. It's innate, it's unchosen, it's fixed. And because of all of those things, it's analogous to race. In fact, this entered the public debate in the 70s, and it's a legacy issue from the civil rights movement. How can we, um, quite rightly, the, the civil rights movement claimed that how can we um, pick on people or discriminate against people against, uh, because of something that is innate and unchosen, and the homosexual rights movement just grabbed that and said, well, our sexuality is innate and unchosen too. So you we can claim the same grounds of discrimination. And that's very useful because it means that everybody who contradicts their point of view is the moral equivalent of a racist. So since all people are equal, then in this view, all sexual orientations must also be equal. So identity and behaviour are the same thing again. And we're still arguing about that legacy issue of homosexuals can be homosexuals, but good or just the same, or different, or what do we think about them, but in any case, we're dealing with a concept that is not a Christian concept. Um, and then there's this view that because sex and love are um, connected, that's a basic human need, that homosexual behaviours flow from a homosexual identity in exactly the same way that heterosexual behaviours flow from a heterosexual identity. So we're being encouraged to believe that some behaviours are just natural for some people. Now, homosexual behaviours that might be harmful for a heterosexual person are natural for a homosexual person. That's what we're being invited to believe. And we have this view expressed by... Um, former Justice Michael Kirby, who says that if sexuality arises from your orientation, then it is just irrational to persist in the demonization of sexual acts because they are the acts that are natural to the homosexual person. To reach out for fullness of being, for love of another, for companionship and for fidelity and trust in another human being. Now, this is good for heterosexual people and it is noble and wonderful in life. So in that view, homosexual behaviours are just the same as heterosexual behaviours. Just different people like different things. And it's a bit of a whitewash on what actually goes on in, in homosexual cultures. But um, we'll, we'll pass that one by. That's just explaining the point of view to you. Now, there are a lot of people of goodwill who stand on this moral high ground and think that this is the compassionate response to the issue of homosexuality. And they're good people. And, if you, and we agree on a lot of things. So if you say diversity to the people who believe in sexual orientation, well, they'll still say, well, diversity just means valuing individual difference while maintaining equality for everyone. And if you say inclusion to this group, well, they will understand that that is just the inclusion of this fixed minority of people within the existing heteronormative social order. So they're still in favour of democratic pluralism, they're still in favour of the family, they're still in favour of child protection. And they're very, very confident that this is the only right and compassionate response to the whole issue. So you have um, Peter Fitzsimons expressed this beautifully recently where he said, well, we used to think that people who were left-handed were an aberration, that they were a problem, and then we used to think that people who were gay were a problem, that they were an aberration. 21st century, we understand that being gay is like being left-handed, like having red hair, like having freckles. It's no big deal. So he's, he's very secure that he owns the moral high ground there. But the thing is, he doesn't. And I'm going to outline four problems with what he has to say. Problem number one, sexual orientation is not a thing. It is many different things. And the queer theorists know this because they study sexuality. And when you study sexual orientation, what are you actually studying? Because it might have many different elements. 
We might, for example, talk about attractions, behaviours, identity self-label. Are we talking about people that belong to a certain community, people that indulge in certain fantasies, felt needs for certain forms of companionship? What, what are we actually talking about when we talk about sexual orientation? Because it could mean a number of different things. And then each of these things is themselves a complex concept. So if we talk about attraction, are we talking about arousal patterns or romantic feelings or desires for company? And are these present sporadically or all the time? Are they intense or not so intense? Are they uh, pervasive and long-term? Are they exclusive? Are they shallow? How, how do you measure feelings? And then the more that you look at... So, so these, these concepts are hard to define, and then they uh, are complex within themselves. So the more you map these things out, the more you find that uh, these constellations hardly ever align. So the more carefully researchers map these constellations, the more complicated the picture becomes because few individuals report uniform intercorrelations between these domains. So the more you look at sexual orientation, the more you realise that you're dealing with a, a strange basket of mismatching variables and you can't put different people into different categories on the basis of them. And if you ask about attractions, behaviours and identity, which are at least the three standard ones that people should be mapping, you find that you get quite different um, answers to those different questions from the same people. So sexual orientation is not a thing. It is many things. And this is where queer theory really sits. That's what they're studying. And then problem number two is that even if, even if it were a thing, um, it makes us ask the wrong questions because we're still dealing with the inherited concept of the homosexual and we're just trying to redeem that concept. So we're saying, is the homosexual the same or different? Is the homosexual good or bad, sinful or virtuous? And these are just the wrong questions to be applying to people. So some better questions to ask might be, must same-sex attracted people act on those attractions? And there have been some examples where people have been very badly advised. For example, if a woman with three children who is married suddenly has same-sex attraction for a woman and she went along to a counsellor, they might say, ah, it's because actually you're a lesbian and you never realised that before. So what you need to do in order to live out that identity is to leave your husband and children and go and shack up with your girlfriend because that's who you really are. And any other sort of life would be not being true to your real identity. So that's probably not going to be some very good advice, particularly if a few years later she finds that that was actually a transitory thing. Does a young boy who thinks he might be gay therefore need to act uh, out on that, those attractions and follow a particular life course? Must his life trajectory be set by the fact that he has these attractions, which may be transitory? Um, so if you, if you think that it's a thing and it's fixed, then you get one set of outcomes which actually might not be very good outcomes for people because, we're not, because we've misunderstood the concept. Must we, in order to live flourishing lives, always act on what we want to do? And we wouldn't say that about a heterosexual man who suddenly had attractions for a younger woman. Ah, actually, that's your orientation. You must now leave your wife and children and go and shack up with that girl. We would think that that was a bad thing to do. So why are we now having different moral judgments about same-sex behaviours than we would about um, heterosexual behaviours? So one of the things that I want to say um, is, is a much better idea is just to take identity out of the picture, to decouple identity and behaviours, and to instead ask what sort of behaviours, whether in the sexual realm or elsewhere, tend to be conducive to a healthy life and flourishing, and what kinds of behaviours tend to undermine a healthy life and flourishing. Problem number three is that born that way is just wrong. Sexuality is not fixed and innate, and we know that. I won't go through um, all of these studies, but just to, um, there have been a number of people who were blown away by this idea, so it's really just to give you some idea of, of where to find the information if you're interested in following that further. Uh, Dr. Lisa Diamond is a lesbian um, activist and a, a co-editor of the uh, American Psychological Association Handbook on Gender and Se um, Sexuality and Psychology. And she's done a lot of longitudinal studies on, um, uh, on adult women in particular and has found that their identity label, their behaviours and their attractions change over time and then she's done that for men as well. And her conclusion is that sexual orientation, including attraction, behaviour and identity self-label, so all three domains... Uh, um, is fluid for both adolescents and for adults and for men and women. So it's not a fixed thing. It's not the result of prenatal determination, and we know that from... Sorry, I'll go back to... We know that from um, this 
big study in, in German, in sorry, Denmark, two million people. It was a, a population-based survey, and it showed specifically that um, that parental absence in childhood correlated with an increased likelihood of same-sex attraction or same-sex relationship in adulthood, but specifically the absence of the same sex parent. And for every year that that parent was absent, the chances of entering into a same-sex relationship increased. So their conclusion was that prenatal factors alone cannot account for the variation in human sexual orientations. Whatever ingredients determine your sexual preferences and marital choices, our population-based study shows that environmental factors are important. There's a longitudinal study for adolescent health in America that has been following a cohort of 12,000 students from the 90s, and that shows that almost all of the students, over 80% in the main, of people who reported same-sex attraction in adolescents identified as heterosexual after the age of 25. There's all sorts of reasons why that might be, um, including the jokester element, like a lot of them were just pulling, pulling their leg, um, answering the question wrongly when they were teenagers. And one of the, the funny um, bits of evidence for that is that there were several hundred of them reported having an artificial limb, and then it was found later on that actually only two of them did. <laughs> Um, one other piece of information that um, I'll, I'll come to the surveillance studies later on, but one of the pieces of evidence that I think is significant here is that um, Alfred Kinsey in 1948 published this sexual behaviour of the human male. It was supposed to be a landmark study. And in that, he referred to the expert advice of experts in juvenile sexuality. So we would call them pedophiles. And he said that these experts were of the opinion that if you wanted to make a homosexual man, you needed to get to the boy before puberty. If boys got through puberty without this sexual instruction from an older man, then they were very likely to be heterosexual. So they certainly thought that there was some behavioural, cultural, environmental influence that played a role in the um, establishment of an adult uh, homosexual identity. And also the um, tactics of the porn industry show us that this is an industrial product that is very aware that human sexuality is a malleable thing. Now we're going to come to problem number four, and this is really uh, where the rubber hits the road. This is one of the things that I think we need to unpack and look at a lot more closely. Problem number four is that if we believe born that way, it supports what I call the stigma narrative. So the stigma narrative, and we have an example of it here in, um, this is the research that is now driving Australian school policy from, it's called Writing Themselves In. It was produced right here in Melbourne at La Trobe. And the thesis of this research is that same-sex attracted youth suffer high levels of verbal and physical homophobic abuse, particularly at school. Homophobic abuse is causally related to feeling unsafe and using excess drug use and, and self-harm and suicide attempts. Therefore, we need an anti-bullying program. So this is safe schools. Now, the problem is that if you believe that um, the only thing that's different about these kids is some sort of pre prenatal identity, they are LGBT, that's just who they are, well, then you get single factor causation um, being logical. If everyone's the same here and yet there are different outcomes here, well, it must be something societal. It must be something extrinsic to the individual rather than something intrinsic. So therefore, we believe the stigma narrative. Um, this research, by the way, was not designed to support same-sex attracted children. We have the research where they're out there saying, oh, no, no, we were actually designing research that would provide the rationale for social change. Now, social change is one of the catch cries of the sexual rights activists, so I'll come back to them. Now, one of the problems with the stigma narrative is that you will believe then it's because these kids are picked on. It's something extrinsic. We can't look at what else is going on for these kids. But the research in America, where they incidentally, they wanted to provide the same rationale, but they already had a very good data set, which surveyed all sorts of health risks in use. And so we have a lot more data on what's actually going on for these LGBT kids. LGB kids, sorry. So we know that LGB kids are less likely to eat enough fruit. And they don't eat as many vegetables as other kids. They don't eat breakfast. They're less likely to drink milk. They're less likely to drink more than two glasses of water a day, less likely to sleep an average of four hours, eight hours a night, less likely to exercise, less likely to have seen a dentist in the last 12 months. On the other hand, they are more likely to use drugs, suffer depression, attempt suicide, use computers more than three hours a day, struggle with obesity, have had sex before the age of 13. I'll come back to that. They're more likely to have been raped. They're more likely to have been made to do unwanted sexual acts by a partner. They're more likely to have been deliberately hurt by a sexual partner in the last 12 months. And these kids are 14 to 17 years old. They're more likely to have had sex with more than four sexual partners. So 
this is what's going on for LGB kids who come to the school counsellor and say, I'm feeling a bit depressed. And does this child really need an anti-bullying program to help them? Do you think that's really a compassionate response to what's going on to this child? So my problem with the stigma narrative is that it makes us look in completely the wrong places because we're looking at identities and social responses to those identities. We're not looking at individuals and what's actually happening for these kids. So we'll just spend a little bit of time looking at how does sexual abuse victimisation fit in if we believe born that way? If we come to this with our minds formed, know this is prenatally determined, they're born that way, well then how do we understand that actually statistically a greater percentage of the LGB adult population report experiences of childhood sexual abuse victimisation? So there are three ways that if, if you didn't have born that way, if you didn't have your born that way goggles on, there are three ways that you might understand that. You might think that childhood sexual abuse victimisation contributes to the development of a non-heterosexual orientation in adulthood. And that's certainly what Kinsey's pedophiles would tell us. Number two, you might think that children who have um, uh, latent signs of a future LGB identity stand out for predators, so they get picked on particularly. Or number three, these are not mutually exclusive. Certain factors might contribute to both childhood sexual victim abuse victimisation and non-heterosexual tendencies in adulthood. For example, dysfunctional family or an alcoholic parent. And that fits in with the rest of the evidence from, from the, the not eating vegetables and not going to a dentist. Otherwise, we have to think that parents don't like their LGBT kids enough to take them to the dentist as often as other kids. And I just think that that's a ridiculous idea. Much more logical is to think that this is a picture of vulnerability. LGB identification is associated with other indices of vulnerability. So, but if we believe born that way, we're not going to look at number one or three, we're just going to look at number two, which doesn't fit with the evidence. So it's very, very important. Who would want us to ignore those other possibilities? And, and that's why it's so important that we understand that there is a third party to the national conversation, and they are sexual rights activists. Now, in order to understand this point of view, you really need to just bend your minds into some interesting shapes and go with me. Because what they're thinking about the human identity is that everything that's important about you can be expressed in your sexual orientation and gender identity. This is an appeal to Gnosticism. It's a disembodied um, identity. From Kinsey, they get the idea that um, sexual diversity is normal. So what Kinsey did was he said, well, we've got the human animal. That's, that's how we're going to consider you know, the, the marvellous work of creation that God did in humanity. Well, we're just an animal. We're a lump of a collection of processes, and including digestion, for example. Well, we don't make moral assumptions about people's digestive tracts, do we? So why would we make assumptions about their sexual responses? So what we need to do is just remove all moral judgments from all sexual responses. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors going on here. But basically, where you end up at is that sexual morality, sex sexual expression should not be limited by morality. All sexual ex expression is legitimate. And when I say all, I mean all. That means polyamory, BDSM, paedophilia, incest, bestiality. It's all just a physiological response, isn't it? So it doesn't act, it's not connected to anything transcendent. It's not connected to the rest of the human personality. It's just a fun toy. We should play with it. And then this group also appeals to um, neo-Marxist ideas that sexual morality is part of an architecture that supports the family. Um, the family relies on heterosexual monogamy to, to scaffold it. So what we want to do is, is break all of that down because we know that the family is actually the tool of capitalist oppression to keep us all in our places and keep us reproducing the workforce. And we also feel, from a neo-Marxist point of view, that a queer minority will always be othered. So we can't be included in a society that is heteronormative. We need the queer revolution in order to achieve inclusion. So you see these words mean quite different things depending on what ideology you filter them through. So who are these people and what do they want? Well, they're the militant gay lobby that used to be called the Gay Liberation Front, and they advocate for LGBT rights. We have the sex industry who, you know, pornography, sex toy shops, sex workers' rights, they have a commercial interest in that. Abortion and sexual health providers, multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. Um, pedophiles and their advocates, and they advocate for sexual, children's sexual rights, and then you get the Marxists and the queer revolutionaries and the non-binary priesthood of superheroes who love Judith Butler and who want to liberate us all from the oppression of heteronormativity. 
And the thing that you need to notice is that these are not separate groups. These are the same people smiling sweetly in our parliament and making the same stigma arguments for all kinds of sexual rights. They're not different people. And one of the ways that you can tell this is that they all appeal to the stigma argument. The stigma argument is essential to the architecture of the ideology, the way that they want the population to think through sexuality. So just to show you how this works in the context of sex workers' rights, how do we explain the fact that prostituted women statistically have very high instances of PTSD? Well, it can't be anything about the sex because they're just empowered sex workers exercising agency and um, autonomy. So if sex workers are traumatised by the experience, well, it must be because of social stigma. It must be because of those nasty moralists who make them feel bad about it. So those Christians, we need to make you shut up. And what we need is more visibility and more celebration of sex work. And if you apply this then to advocates for children's sexual rights, they will tell you, how do we explain that children are traumatised by um, sexual contact with adults? And they will say, well, children are sexual from birth. We're appealing to their ontology. That's who they really are. Um, so how do we explain the trauma? Well, that's because parents and teachers and the legal system shames them for doing what's natural for them. And those people are then abusive. So who's hurting the children? It's the abusive parents. And if you listen to the um, narratives of pedophiles, the abusive parents are the ones who want to protect their children from pedophiles, because pedophiles are loving, you see. And then um, LGBT rights, we have the same narrative again, and it will be familiar to you by now. LGBT, LGBT people are just expressing who they really are, but it's really overlaid with this strong identity. Um, and society doesn't accept this, therefore it's all stigma. So these arguments we need to understand are advanced by people who have a personal, commercial, and political interest in the sexual exploitation of the vulnerable. And if you think that an identity in an LGBT child is actually just a big flag for vulnerability and they know it, well, who wants those kids to come forth and identify themselves? And I think that that's a very sinister way to look at what's actually going on in our school system. So what we're doing is we're advocating for the freedom of the vulnerable to come forth and be exploited. So just... Uh, to teach you, to talk you through how we then navigate the political debates, how this influences so many different policies that are coming through, we need to understand the common ground between the people who believe in sexual orientation and the people who believe in sexual diversity. Because both of these ideas will give you one um, common ground. And the common ground is that an LGBT identification is not in itself a sign of brokenness. Therefore, all the suffering must be from stigma. So then if you think about how we think through different ideas, well, if, what about recruitment? Can you recruit somebody to an LGBT identity? Well, the orientationists will say, well, that's ridiculous. Of course you can't because it's fixed from birth. And the, essential, the diversity people will say, of course you can, and it's absolutely necessary that we do because that's consistent with liberation. If we then look at conversion therapy, what do we think about conversion therapy? Really, I think if you had red hair and freckles and you weren't happy about it, you should be able to get counselling for it. But these people will say, well, no, because it's futile. You're just shaming them. You're, you're reinforcing the idea that being homosexual is bad, so therefore we, sh we shouldn't have um, conversion therapy. That's what the orientationists would say. And the diversity people will say, we shouldn't have conversion therapy because it's oppressive, because everyone would be queer. So what, what we're trying to do is just squash them back into their little heteronormative boxes. What about comprehensive sexuality education? Well, the orientationists would say, well, it's necessary for the sexual health of the few LGBT kids who we know are in that room, because they're born that way, and it's going to be harmless for heterosexual kids to learn about gay sex, isn't it? Because they're fixed as well. They're going to be heterosexual. Well, the diversity people don't think that at all. They think that a comprehensive sexuality education is necessary to teach sexual diversity to everybody in the school system. What about safe schools? It's necessary to stop bullying on the one hand, and these pe the diversity people think it's necessary to disrupt heteronormativity. So do you see how this common ground that they've, that between these two groups is actually working very powerfully for, in the interests of the um, sexual diversity people? And then if you play through these different words, what, what's an abusive parent, what's homophobia, what's inclusion, what's diversity, we think we're speaking the same language, and we're absolutely not. In fact, I think I have it on this slide here. Whoops. Um, can I go back? Yes. So the Born That Way advocates are useful idiots. 
supporting an ideology that they have, not, they have imperfectly understood. So Lenin used this expression of the Americans who would come to the Soviet Union and go home saying, it's marvellous. And he said they were useful idiots because he, they were really supporting communism, but they didn't understand it. And I think that that's exactly where the sexual orientation people are. So sorry, Peter Fitzsimons. Uh, but as for us, we, not need, we do not need to be ashamed for refusing to march in the rainbow parade. Because the human person is more than a sexual identity. All people are equal, but all sexual behaviours are not. Thank you.